All right, here we go. Let's take a look at the last section of the chapter here. We're going to rock and roll with some more uh, applications here and whatnot, looking at different models. We're going to start with Jeff Bezos here. So I got young Jeff Bezos, current Jeff Bezos, uh, and we're looking at his net worth. And this is in billions of dollars. Holy cow, this guy's worth some cash here. Let's go ahead and graph his uh, net worth over time here, and then we're going to see if we can find a model that kind of fits the data here. So I went ahead and I make sure the bottom here on the x-axis is years since 1994. It's just a little cleaner to say like zero years since 1994. On the y-axis, I've got the uh, net worth in billions, and I start plotting some points here. So he started off with no billion dollars, pretty regular guy. In 1998, he's at 12 billion. 2002, he's only at 10 billion, a mere 10 billion. Then they, we had the dot com burst in 2000, uh, the bubble burst in 2008. He went down to uh, only 2 billion. But since then, Jeff Bezos has been on a roll. You can see that. Holy cow, this guy is worth some cash right here. So that's pretty awesome. So what we'd like to do is kind of. Okay, so let's look at the data here. So if we look at his net worth in time, he kind of went on this nice little, he was increasing, then he had the de decrease, and then he started increasing again. So roughly it looks something like this. And we're going to say, okay, what kind of shape is that? Well, it looks kind of like a cubic function. So we're going to try to model his net worth over time with a cubic function. To do that, we're going to put in the calculator. And I don't want to put the years in there. So we're going to do a, a new category over here. So maybe you can write this right on your paper. We're going to say it's going to be years since 1994. So that just makes it easier to put in the calculator. So 1994 would be zero years since 1994. 1998 would be four years later. So add this little column here. Uh, four years after that would be 2002. Then I'm going to be six years later, seven years later, uh, three years later, and then two more. So there we go. So 2020 is 26 years after 1994. Great. So we had to add a little column. Why? It's just going to be nice for our calculator. Go to your calculator. So if you don't know where I'm at here, oh, I don't know where I'm at here either. <laughs> Let's quit out of this. Clear your screen. Uh, I want to put in data here. So I want to put this table in my calculator. So right next to the left cursor is the stat button. Go ahead and stat. And the very first one is called edit. We're going to edit our list. So if you've never done this, we've got list one, list two. We're going to put our X's and Y's in. So let's go ahead and do that. So it starts off with zero for uh, our, X at, our X data there. Then four, eight. And you may have to pause this because I'm pretty fast because I'm actually using my keyboard. So I'm just typing, which is kind of nice. Uh, and then that's going to be the years. The L2 will be his net worth in billions. So he started off with no billions. And then 12, and then 10, and 2, 50. Oops. Make sure the data is in there correctly. causes all kinds of problems if you don't put the data in right. So our goal here is to graph this data. I want to make a little picture just like the picture we have. So I'm going to slide it over. So I know what the data looks like because I kind of graphed it by hand. But I want to do it all in the calculator and then create this model, this green line here. Um, so if you've never done this, you may have to pause and rewind it because it, it's kind of a lot of steps. If you've done it before, you can just cruise on through. You should be good to go. So to see the data, we're going to go up here to blue. Above Y equals, it says stat plot. So hit second Y equals. Just make sure this is turned on. Mine's turned on, but if it wasn't, use hit enter and just highlight on using the enter button. You got a couple different graphs to choose from. We're going to choose the scatter plot. Then just to kind of get things going, I always kind of zoom standard. If I go to zoom six, okay, so this gives me a 10 by 10 window. It gives me 10 in X direction, 10 in the Y, negative 10, negative 10. It's the basic window. But you can see that doesn't fit my data over here. I can see some points, but not all the points. So really setting the window is one of the more challenging things of the calculator. So what are X's? Well, X's are years since 1994. So the minimum would be zero. How many years do I want to see? Well, I see the highest 26. I'm going to go ahead and go to 30 years and give myself a little buffer. And then this is the X scale. What do I want to count by? Awesome. How about the Y? The Y is his billions of dollars. So the least you could be zero billion dollars for our data. Hopefully you don't owe any billions of dollars. And then he was up to 136. I'm just going to go ahead and go up to 150, give myself a little cushion to see everything. And now I don't really want to count to 150 by one. So maybe I'm going to count by tens or something like that to kind of get there. So now when I graph, I should get a much better picture. Now I can kind of see that data right there. Awesome. So there's a good picture of the data. So our goal is to kind of model it with some kind of what we're going to say regression line. So let's go ahead and do that. So to do a regression line, go back to stat, that left cursor, slide over to calculate. Up top here, we're going to slide over to calculate. And we've got all kinds of choices. We've got uh, linear regression, quadratic regression, cubic regression, quadratic regression, all kinds of regressions. Everybody's got regressions. 
We thought it looked like a cubic, so we're going to start off with a cubic regression. So go ahead and hit enter. It's going to double check that you're pulling from L1, L2, which is Coolio. I'm going to come down here to calculate. I'm going to go ahead and just calculate this bad boy. And hopefully you get something like that. If you put your data in, same, I'm going to kind of copy it over here so I have it. There's my data. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we have the equation of the best fit curve. So the calculator will tell you the best cubic function in this form. So it's ax cubed, bx squared, cx, d. And it tells you what all those are, what all the coefficients are. So, all right, let's write this bad boy out here. So I don't think I'm going to have room over here where it says write the regression equation for the best curve. So I'm going to write it down here because I think it's going to be quite the big equation here. So let's write this out. We've got this function. And what is the A term? It's 0 0.0278, blah, blah, blah. So the rule is we're going to write to three decimal places uh, for AP unless they tell us otherwise. This would probably be a multiple choice question, I'm guessing. But let's write to three decimals. So 0 0.027. And then I get to choose here. Do I want to round or truncate? For this problem, I'm going to truncate. This means I'm not going to look at the next digit. I'm just going to stop writing at that third digit here. So that's going to be to what? X cubed. Next one is negative, so the B term will be minus 0 .0, I'm sorry, 0 0.699. Again, I'm not rounding. I'm truncating on this one. So that just means I'm going to stop writing. You don't have to worry about the rounding. I think you make less mistakes there. Uh, so it's 0.699. The C term is 0 0.470. So we're going to add 4.70. And what is that? That is my X's. And then the last term here, the constant's going to be 1.091. So that's truncated. If you want to round those, that's totally cool. You can round to three digits, and that will play too. Nice. Awesome. Here's another cool little trick. Let me show you this. Because ideally now, what you could do is go to your y equals. You could type that bad boy in there, and then we can graph it and see it. But here's a little shortcut. If you go back, let's run it again, and it's good practice for you if you need to see it twice. We go stat, we go calc, we're going to slide over to calc. We're going to pick our regression, so sometimes they're linear, quadratic, we're going to go cubic. And now, I, I kind of skipped over this, but we don't ever mess with the frequency list, but this store regression equation is great. If you want to store this in the y equals, you got to go over here to vars uh, for variables, right by the down cursor. Slide over to y vars, y variables. We're talking about functions, so hit enter. And there it is. You can put it in any of these slots here. I'm just going to put it in Y1. And now go ahead and calculate it. It's going to tell you the same stuff. So nothing changed here. But now if you look at your Y equals what happened here, it put it in there and it didn't round anything. Look at all the digits there. That is pretty awesome. And so when I graph it, I get something that looks like this. That's pretty cool. So I'm going to bring that over here because I like the looks of that. So there is the graph in the calculator. Now, is it going to hit every point perfectly? No, it's a model. Some are going to be above, some are going to be below, but it's a nice general idea of uh, kind of representing what's happening. Now, once we have the model, we can use it to make predictions, uh, different things like that. So our question here is, let's go ahead and do it, is finding the average rate of change. So I want to find the average rate of change from this point to this point. And maybe let's see if I'm kind of covering it up here, but remember our year since. Let's go back to our year since. So what was 2008? 2008 was 14 years. So that's going to be the F of 14. And then I also want to find 2022. Well, that would be on my list. That would be 28. So I want to find the F of 28. And again, let's go to our calculator for help because I, I don't want to... I'm going to type all that in the calculator. We can put this back now if you want. Make sure he's back where he likes to hang out over here. Uh, go back to your calculator. And a couple tricks here too. All kinds of calculator tricks this time. Uh, whoa, come on back here. All right. So what can we do here? Well, a couple things. You can go to your table, and it looked like I was already have those in there. Ha, look at that. So I'm trying to find uh, 14 and 28. Well, there they are right there. You can go to the table and ask them whatever you want. Another cool trick if you want on your home screen, you can use that VARS again, and it's good practice. VARS, slide over Y VARS, function number one. And then what do you want to plug in there? It's just like function notation. You want to plug 14 in there. So if you prefer to do it that way, it's still going to tell you it's 6.19. Then you could do the same thing again. Vars, Y vars function. I'm still talking about Y1. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to put 28 in. So if you prefer that method, that's pretty cool too. And that gives me, I'll go ahead and just steal it so I have it over here. I'm going to have um, those two points right there. 
All right, let's finish this bad boy up here. So, 14 years after 1994, he's worth what? Six point, remember, three decimal places. We're always going to go three decimal places, so it's going to be 6.193. Uh, so you can either truncate or round. Let's round this time, mix it up. So I'm going to look at the number after it. Uh, it's a four. I don't need to round, but I just want to show you you could round. I know some people really do not like to truncate. I'm not sure why. It's okay. You can choose whichever you prefer. Uh, how about 28 years after uh, 1994? So it's 194.967. And I'm going to round this time. So I am going to look at the one after it. Oh, it is going to say round up. So this one if I'm rounding, would be 0.968. So you can end at 7, you can end it at 8. Either way is Coolio, uh, your option there. Awesome. Let's go ahead and write the rate of change here. So the change in Y, he was, he's was he got this massive uh, net worth here of 194.968. And the change in Y on top is going to be, he was a mere 6.193. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos. Uh, how about this on the bottom, 28 there's a change in his years. So what is that? So if I subtract his Y values, I think it's going to be 188.775. Don't be impressed. That was not mental math. I cheated and used a calculator. I didn't cheat. We're allowed to use a calculator on this section. So we're cool. And then I will do the mental math on that. 28 minus 14 is 14. If you divide that bad boy out, what is Jeffrey Bezos' rate of change here? It's looking like it is 13 point what, 4839. And then since I was rounding before, I'm going to keep rounding. I'm going to say 0.4 on that bad boy. So that is what, in dollars? It's in billions of dollars. Holy cow. So his rate of change is 13.484 billion dollars per year or every year, however you want to write that, uh, from 2008 to 2022. That's pretty good. That is pretty impressive. Excellent. Uh, moving on. So when we do this types of regression, I just wanted to draw them so you can see what's coming up. Obviously, we know linear. We've done this before type of thing. So maybe you've got this correlation like here, a little positive correlation. Linear, you just draw that straight line through it. So if you see your data like that, yeah, we can see some linear regression. Quadratic, uh, just be careful because sometimes, you know, it's just got a little like, I call it like a little baby curve to it. So maybe just a little bit. So I'm just kind of sketching some things in. Now, that doesn't look like your classic parabola, but think of this super wide parabola. Like, if you have this super wide, it is still a parabola. It's still quadratic. So, if you've got a little curve to it, uh, think about using quadratic. Again, maybe a cubic is going to look like, I always think it looks like an N, something like this. We're going to think cubic. Quartic looks like a W, or maybe we'll flip them. Remember, these can be negative, too. So, if you got, like, a McDonald's sign or something, that's going to be quartic. Um, so, those are the main four we're going to use in this section. Down here, remember exponential growth, something like this is going up. Logarithmic is its inverse, looks like that. And then logistics, I don't know if you've seen these before. They are used a lot in populations where you increase and then you plateau off at a certain point. Population kind of tapers off. And then my personal favorite, sine and cosine. Woo, remember those curves that go on and on forever and ever and ever. So I uh, just want to show you, we're going to use the top row for now, and then these are the next chapters coming up. So you got something to look forward to. Exponential and logs, next chapter, sign, chapter three. So we're going to kind of look at the shape, pick one of these, and then run the regression. Awesome. Let's talk about the other kind of word problem in this section that can happen is things that are inversely proportional. Now, these are actually pretty chill, but they can look kind of crazy. Just know the, the formula for inversely proportional is just why is some constant over x. So don't freak out, where k is just the constant of proportionality. So if you have this formula, it's really pretty chill. Don't freak out. Sometimes these get super science-y, but um, I mean, I like science, but I'm not like, I'm not a Stephen Hawking here. So don't freak out. You can still do it, even if you don't know exactly what's going on in science. Just listen, just follow the, the, the wording here. So example, the force of Newton's exerted by a magnet of metal object is here's the key. As soon as you see inversely proportional, we're thinking this formula right here. So, and then write what you know. You know, you have a force. The magnets have some kind of force, so I'll call it F. I know it's going to be K over something because that's what the inversely proportional means. It says the square of the distance. I can square a distance. So again, don't freak out. Just kind of set it up with some letters. Then we're going to plug stuff in. So it tells me, hey, your magnet has a force of 60 newtons. So just plug that in, 60 newtons right there. I don't know what the constant is. You don't know what K is to start these usually. And then it says it's 60 newtons on an object if it's two centimeters away. So that's going to be two squared right there. And then we just got to solve for this. So don't freak out. We're actually going to find K. So that's really just four. I mean, I'll write it. 
Oh my gosh, that 60 is terrible. <laughs> I was trying to go too fast there. So it's k over 2 squared is just 4. And now let's solve this bad boy here. You're just going to times both sides by 4. So not bad. So really we're looking at 240 is our k or our constant of proportionality. So once you have k, you're golden. Ooh, that's a, that's a rough looking k. Is that better? Just make it bigger and then it's okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to come over here now that I found it and I'm going to use it. So I know the equation was force equals k. Well, I know k is 240. In this situation, I just found k and it's over the distance squared. So there's usually a follow-up question here. They kind of give you some information. They say, okay, well, what about when the force is 10 newtons? So put that in for 10 and then I've got 240 over d squared. And then I'm just going to solve for d squared. So uh, the key is just kind of set it up. And then it's just a matter of plug and chug, man. Just kind of power through it. Let's multiply both sides by d squared. Multiply by d squared. These cancel. And then I've got 10 d squared equals 240. And then I'm going to divide by 10. My handwriting is going downhill here. So those are gone. So we're looking at what? So d squared is 240. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 24. Oh, big difference there. So if um, I want to find D, just square root both sides. It looks like the square root of 24. You can go ahead and decimify that if you want. It's somewhere almost 5, like 4.8 something. Um, or leave it as the exact value. We should probably label it, though. What is this? We're talking about it must be the square root of 24 centimeters away. Boom, that's it. So you don't have to know a ton about magnets. You just got to set up and know this little y uh, equals k over x. So there's a couple problems on inversely proportional. Nice. All right, let's wrap it up here with some piecewise functions. So uh, we kind of did this last section. We were, when we were looking at the graphs of piecewise functions. Now we're going to look at them algebraically. We're going to actually look at the function here uh, and use that to solve some problems. So situation we got going on here, we've got snow, a big snowstorm and the snow accumulating. So X is the times after the snow started. F is the depth. So I want to do something like, hey, find the F of 7. Uh, so let's break this bad boy down. What's going on over here? So check it out. This function represents what? Zero to four. This is the first four hours of the snowstorm. So in the beginning, it's a quadratic, which means it's probably snowing pretty quickly, coming down pretty good. Down here, this is for hours four through six after it started. What happened here? Nothing. It quit snowing. So it stayed at 12 inches of snow, didn't move, uh, no snow going on. But then it picks up again from hour six to nine. I see it's not snowing as fast. It's linear. So um, it is kind of going on there. Awesome. So what am I going to do? Well, if I want to find the f of 7, I can totally do that. The f of 7, just find the right function. So I'm looking at hour 7. Hour 7 definitely falls between 6 and 9 here. So plug it in. I can plug and chug all day. Plug that bad boy in. Boom. It's 10. It is 10. Awesome. 10 what? Let's label this. And I'm going to go ahead and type it out. So I'm going to say what? In 7 hours, 7 is the hours, the depth is 10 is it inches or centimeters inches so that is a snowstorm right there so when we look at that at that seven hours and maybe i should say at the seven hour mark instead of in seven hours either way it's pretty cool but at seven hours into the storm we've got 10 inches of snow boom awesome can we find the average rate of change love that average rate of change we've kind of been doing it from the beginning here sure i just need to find what the f of four so the fourth hour and i need to find the f of five the fifth hour Easy peasy. I'm going to go back up to my highlighter because I love that highlighter. Let's find four. Be careful, it's not here. Aha, it's actually here. So this is inclusive. This is less than or equal to four. So I got to use the top function here. So let's plug a little four in there. So it's going to be one fourth x squared, which would be four squared. Four squared is one of my favorite games, by the way. Uh, and then this x is also four. Boom. There it is right here. And let's go ahead and evaluate. What is one fourth of 16? That's just four, isn't it? plus uh, the eight will give me 12 inches of snow. So in the fourth hour, I had 12 inches of snow. Then let's slide down to five. Hour five is gonna be between four and six here. And what am I gonna do here? Oh, I can do this one all day. There's nothing to plug in. It's just 12 inches. It's a constant right here. Oh, that's interesting. Who saw that coming? Uh, check out your Y's. So if I wanna find the rate of change, they're the same. On top, the Y minus Y is 12. And then five minus four. It's just one, but it doesn't matter because you got that big zero on top. There is no rate of change here. So the change doesn't, it's zero inches of snow per hour at this average rate of change between those. So per hour, 
but there is no rate change. It looks like it stopped snowing. That's why we have no rate change. That's kind of a cool one to end on. And that's it. Holy cow. Great job on this chapter. Go ahead and rock out that practice. Good luck on your mastery check. Peace out.